Hey everybody, Stinger here. I want to invite you to a pretty cool podcast. Watch this film. Be quite nice. Have a good time. It'll be very evil. And you'll have that tan housing. Hey, this is Big Sexy Kevin Nash. Yes, it is I, Big E, but more importantly, it is you. And you might remember me from such YouTube greats as being the elite. And Chris Daniels almost dies. And if you're looking for the very best wrestling content, you better come to Good Mike Work Commentary. And I'm just going to tell you now, as a role model, you got to tune into this because if you also want to be a role model, you got to learn from the best. We have a rapport. And we have been so close over so many years. This is not a cameo or a paid endorsement in any regard. This is a message of, of friendship. Uh, man, we met 20 years ago, 21 years ago now. Time is flying, isn't it? Uh, I want to wish you all the best in your YouTube uh, channel. And hopefully I can maybe make a uh, special guest appearance on there sometime. And he used to say, hey, Greg Morgan. And he used to say, please call me Greg. And I wouldn't do it. Good mic work. Commentaries. Awesome YouTube channel. Now, if you've seen these videos before, you know what I'm talking about. We would do verbal chain wrestling. You know, we'd be all, off, in the, off in the yard, the schoolyard at recess. And he's also a 40-year-old wrestling fan. That's a long damn time. And uh, we'd just be staring at each other, and he'd say, uh, hammerlock. And I'd say, all right, I've reversed the hammerlock into a hammerlock of my own, then I put you in a headlock. And, you know, that would go on for hours. He's not gonna fill your head with bullshit. He's gonna tell you, real deal, what's up, and that's that. Raw, SmackDown, NXT. This guy covers it all, my friends. I want you to go to his page, Good Mike Work on YouTube. Check out Good Mike Work commentaries on YouTube. But we would have fun. We would uh, run around. There would be a wooden hoop. We would hit with a stick, and it would go down a hill. I'm about to go and watch a few videos myself. It's a very practical, uh, apparatus. We're really lacking in the world right now with, with some people that have a freaking brain cell. And then now look at him. He has more YouTube views and subscribers than I do, and I'm, I'm fine with it because I played such an integral role in his upbringing. Don't you dare be sour! We always talked about wrestling. He was a big Luthes guy, and of course I had an affectation for the Hackenschmitz. Clap! For good mic work commentaries! This is RJ City, a wrestling rock on tour. And feel the power! <laughs> Listen to the podcast, subscribe. You are watching Good Mic Work Commentaries. Good Mic Work Commentaries. Good Mic Work Commentaries. Good Mic Work Commentaries. Just want to encourage all you guys to check out Good Mic Work Commentaries. And if you don't, we're going to have a problem. Do it! Do it. Do it now! Uh, thanks a lot for the encomium and the nice words about my father's Hall of Fame induction. I uh, hope our paths cross again sometime down the road. would love to shake your hand again, and uh, good luck on this podcast. And you, you don't just watch it one time. You can rewatch every single one of them. And now, Good Mike Work Commentaries and Greg Morgan presents The Winged Eagle Podcast. Happy Saturday, everyone. What's going on? And welcome to your Winged Eagle podcast for September 24th, 2022. Good mic work back at you with a loaded episode this week. We've got a lot to talk about. We've got lots of news and notes. We've got a ton of wrestling results. We've got a couple of pay-per-views to look ahead to and all sorts of just overall funness going on right now in the world of wrestling. And we are here to talk about it. So I hope you guys are having a good weekend so far. Happy Saturday to you. And this should be a good one. Good hour and a half, maybe a two hour podcast, depending on, you know, how deep we dive into some of this stuff. But what we have on the menu this afternoon, we're going to talk about all of this stuff regarding the White White Rabbit and some of the clues that we've been seeing on WWE TV and most believe that this will eventually lead us to Bray Wyatt but what Bray Wyatt form what form will he take is he gonna have 
multiple personalities again? Is it going to be the Fiend? Are we going to see the Firefly Funhouse come to life? Are we going to see a return of the Wyatt family? What's going on? All of this stuff is extremely intriguing, extremely fun to speculate about, and I thought we would have some fun with that here today for sure. So we will get into all of that and a lot of the ideas that I've seen floating around social media and Twitter and whatnot in terms of what Bray Wyatt could actually be doing when and if he does get to WWE. And all signs and evidence right now are pointing right to that. Also, CM Punk reports Reportedly, at least if uh, Wade Keller is to be believed, is probably not going to be coming back to AEW, likely gone for good buyout. Contract buyout is probably what's going to happen there, but we'll discuss, you know, why and when when that comes up here in a little bit. So we'll be getting into CM Punk. Also, we're going to be talking about some other AEW talent that was rumored to be contacted by WWE. We heard about that. Over the past few weeks, Malachi Black uh, is at the top of that list. He was recently given what we thought was a conditional release by AEW. However, it has been learned that I guess he's still under contract. But there were others in AEW that were contacted by WWE as well. And we'll talk a little bit about that, you know, Bobby Fish and, you know, shit like that. So we'll get into that as well. As we saw on Dynamite this past week, Soraya, Soraya, I'm not sure how exactly we're pronouncing her name. Can't remember. Uh, but she did debut the former uh, page in WWE debuted on Dynamite, and it is still unclear whether or not she's going to be in the ring. She did not get physical on Wednesday. It was reported that she wasn't cleared, but then Soraya herself said, don't believe everything you read. So uh, she'll be on Dynamite to, I guess, maybe explain her future this week on Wednesday. We'll also talk a little bit about MJF, who took a photo with Liv Morgan today, which is pretty interesting. I think they're uh, buddies from way back. And his interview a couple of weeks ago with Ariel Hawani, where he did uh, mention a little bit about his contract situation. And he's been teasing every single time he's been on TV that he's going to be going to WWE in 2024, which I believe his contract is up on January 1st. So we will get into that. Gabe Sapolsky is also back in WWE according to the P or according to PW Insider anyway Dynamite I uh, got a pretty decent rating but it was down a bit from last week Smackdown was a really interesting show last night with uh, Sami Zayn becoming an honorary oos and Liv Morgan taking a pretty awesome table bump sent senton from the top rope which I thought was cool and on the other side of that coin the opposite of what Liv Morgan does was what Julia Hart did on Rampage probably the sickest uh, table bump I've ever seen uh, from table from Julia Hart last night but really cool stuff with the great mood is showing up and a really, really packed two-hour rampage. Some would argue that it was a little bit too packed and they had too many matches on there. There was a lot going on, but it was an overall really, really good week of wrestling and that's what we're here to discuss this afternoon. So that's kind of what's on the menu. I'm going to cruise over here to the chat and say hello to everybody. We got to shout out the patrons and we got to shout out the channel members real quick before we get going and I'll knock out any super chats we might have and I'm going to let you guys know what we're going to be doing this weekend. So we've got a watch along coming up tomorrow. Let me make sure I can be heard there. Cool. And if you were in the chat right now, you will see my pinned comment that has a link to the YouTube poll that I just put up a couple of hours ago. I'm going to let that run all night until about midnight my time, which will be 3 a.m. on the East Coast. Once I get to midnight my time, which is about nine hours from now, I'll close the poll and whichever show is in the lead, that's the show I'm going to do for tomorrow's watch along. I posted a members only post and let the members suggest shows. And then I took the four uh, that I liked the best or that were suggested more than once and I put them up in a Twitter poll and it's available right now as you can see I believe the shows are Taboo Tuesday 2005 Breakdown in Your House 1998 Ground Zero in Your House 1997 or No Way Out 2001 so those are the choices currently available on the poll right now it is no way out running away with it it's kind of funny because no way out's the one i was hoping would not win to be honest but i think it's going to win and we're probably going to wind up doing uh no way out 2001 is it right now commands 70 percent of the vote and a little less than 100 votes in right now in the first 43 minutes. So you can cru cruise over there, make your vote for tomorrow's watch along. As of right now, unless something drastically changes, it looks like it's going to be No Way Out 2001. So later on tonight, when I get home from work, I'll post the podcast here on the podcast sites, and I will make tomorrow's link for whatever winds up winning the poll. So that'll be coming up uh, tomorrow. So keep that in mind. It should be a fun one as we watch a classic WWE pay-per-view while we eyeball the Sunday night football game. It's fun here on Sunday nights. 
I also want to cruise over to the channel members and say hello and welcome all of them and shout out all of the great channel members who have joined since we launched the membership program just a couple of months ago. I want to thank Ian Dunn and Kevin, who just came in two days ago, Sam Piboon, Jeff McMahon, Deshaun Robinson, Mikey Too Cool, Luke McAllister, Tar Brehan, Damon Smith, Zelius Ward, William, Ian Dunn again. I swear, I see your name more than once every week. Uh, we've got Queasy, as well as Bo, as Bo Kavlovic, Al Ramos Pro, Zach H., Chaz Medeiros, Chris Miner, Mike Witt, Danny Allmark, Jimmy Anderson, C-Mac, Mab, Joshua Aparicio, How Weezy, Spaz Phoenix, Ronnie, Nicole Lensing, Marcus the Entertainer, Nikita Abalakin, Divine Ricks, Zane G, Chris Barrera, Michael Kumo, John G. E. Dennett, John J. E. Dennett, excuse me, S. Tatanani, Nick Musser, K Dogs Kennel, Max Pokebra, Spectra, Zach Paulgett, Red Raven Rucker, Reese Jones, Victor Cologne, Isaac, George Morris, Stephen Taylor, Population 420, and JJ Leg. Thank you to all of the current channel members. If you would like to join and uh, sign up for some of the perks here on the channel, you can do so by clicking the join button right below this video or click the link in the description. We'll take you right over to the information there and you can become a channel member where you will have uh, kind of a priority when it comes to picking these watch alongs and uh, of course Q&A's and early peeks at some videos and I will have some channel member info coming to you guys for members only uh, about a big big project currently in the works on the channel so you guys can keep a lookout for that. I also want to cruise to the Patreon page. We do have a Patreon page over here on the channel as you guys know. Uh, at one point I thought about shutting it down but I support uh, other creators on Patreon. So we're going to keep it. And some of you are very kind to support over there or on YouTube. And some of you support on both. So I want to thank as well Zach Powgett, Joseph Hudson, Chris Broski, Divine Ricks, Nikita Abalakin, Chris Miner, Super Fluffy Toaster, Deshaun Robinson, Martin Can, Apron Bump Podcast, Alan Carter, Brandon Yelverton, Nick Musser, K Dogs, Kennel, Ryan Y, Devlin Husban, John Redifer, Claudio Klabadetscher, Daniel Rodriguez, Reese Jones, Josiah Blevins, John Riffle, Michael Cuomo, Navid, Blake Moran. Thank you guys, as always, for your support on the Patreon page. And last but not least, I just want to cruise over here and say hi to Luke McAllister, who chimed in with a nice super chat earlier on. Hey, Greg, how's things? I think at this point, it's best for AEW to part ways with CM Punk. He seems to be doing more harm than good. We will be getting to CM Punk here in just a minute. And actually, Luke, I'm in total agreement with you and pretty much have been since uh, Brawl Out took place it seems like uh you know regardless of what side you want to be on in this uh cm punk needs to go and it's starting to look like that is going to be the likely result of all of this when the dust settles good to see divine ricks in here member for two months my shoot brother hey greg and friends hope you guys are having a great saturday we are and uh, we're having a better one now that you're here george morris chiming in with five bucks thanks dude hey greg how are you doing and how are your cats ww ground zero september 7th 97 suggestion what are you thinking for fall brawl 97 or 98 i like both of those probably 97 i like a little bit better uh that took place in winston-salem uh, north carolina i did not go to that show uh, but it was not far away from me but that was when kurt hennig uh when arn anderson did the my spot promo and kurt hennig took his place and then he turned on the horsemen and joined the nwo that was a pretty good fall brawl i did like your suggestion of ground zero uh, from 97, I threw it up in the poll. Right now, it's not looking like it's going to win, but uh, I was kind of rooting for that one or breakdown, to be honest. Uh, but it looks like I'm going to be doing No Way Out. The members, or I'm sorry, the subscribers have spoken, so that's the way it is. Uh, but of uh, everything else, George, thanks for being here. Cats are doing great. Uh, you know, Bub's doing his thing. He's still hanging in there, and uh, Tito is Tito, and Greg is Greg. So we're all good here at the Podcastle. Also, I want to just say hello to Monique, Beetle, 911, Red Raven, Rucker, Tatanani, Andy Linnell, Chaz, Jay Lambo, Isaac, Big J, David Brown, good to see you. Ben Espiniza, Sam is in the house. We got Zach, David, Zolo, Ronnie is here as well. Uh, you can just say Jay because Jay Zolo is weird. Okay, all right, we'll call you Jay. Jay, sounds good to me. Rock Intensity is also in the house. We've got Yuchiro here as well, Stephen Harris, Chris Maycock. We've got Mab, nice channel members and friends in the house, and Divine Ricks chiming in with five bucks. Hey, Greg, a Sammy Kevin Owens versus Usos feud would be fun. By the way, I brought tickets or bought tickets maybe to AEW Full Gear. Looking forward to it. That's awesome. You're going to be going to Full Gear. <clears throat> That will be an interesting show. Curious if that's going to be the show that MJF actually gets the title shot on or if he's going to pull a fast one prior to then. 
And we also know after last night's uh, Golden Ticket Battle Royal, which Hangman Page won, he'll get a title shot against whoever the champion is way down the line on October 18th, about a month away in Cincinnati on Dynamite. And if Moxley is the champion going into that, that will be in Mox's hometown. So Mox and Hangman could be interesting as well. And dude, when it comes to Sammy and Kevin, we were gonna we're gonna get into Sami Zayn here later on when we talk about SmackDown, but. The Usos, as we saw last night, regained their champion, or I'm sorry, retained the tag team titles yet again. And it is kind of a funny dynamic between Jimmy and Jay. Jimmy seems to love Sami Zayn. Jay fucking hates him. And at some point, you know, I mean, I hope they drag it out, but this whole Sami Zayn thing has been so fun. And eventually, when the time comes, when the bloodline murders him or they kick him out for good or whatever, it would be great to see Kevin Owens, you know, come to his aid. And since the Usos have held and retained these tag team titles for so long, I think the perfect team to take the belts off of them would be Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens. So maybe they're holding out for that. Maybe it's going to take another two months, three months even, maybe near the end of the year to get there. This could even even be a day one pay-per-view type of thing. Have the Usos carry these belts all throughout the rest of the fall, pissing people off even more. And then you do something around the holidays, maybe. You know, maybe the uh, it, it's going to take a long time to stretch it this far, but I'm just shooting the shit here. Freestyling. If you could do some sort of a holiday smackdown and you know, Sami Zayn is presented this big gift by the bloodline, but it turns out to be a big swerve where they turn on him and beat him up and leave him bloodied and broken right before the Christmas holiday, send him home to his family. <laughs> Looking like, you know, he got put through a blender, might be fun, and then have Kevin Owens say, you know, me and Sammy never got, always got along, but we've been friends since, you know, we were kids, and, you know, maybe he's going to step in now and they can book a day one tag title match between Sammy and Kevin and the Usos and finally have uh, Sammy and Owens uh, and Sammy especially get some revenge. But I have bigger fish to fry for Kevin Owens. I definitely think him and Sammy getting together to battle the bloodline uh, is something uh, that we need to see in our future. But I kind of have world title aspirations for Owens. I just think now with Triple H in charge, if this guy goes through yet another year, if we somehow get all the way through 2023, Without Kevin Owens being world champion, I'm going to be disappointed, to be honest. To be honest. Khalid, good to see you. Thank you for being here. Gilbert as well. Welcome. Jermaine Blackwood, great to see you as well, man. Yeah, when I was checking out, Jermaine's right, man. Uh, when I was reading the suggestions by the members about what watch along to do tomorrow, I you know, I don't have fond memories of Breakdown. I ordered it on pay-per-view, and I remember just being like, bleh. But when you look back on it on paper, there's some good matches on there, and that one uh, cage match with Rock, Shamrock, and Mankind. That was that was a big turning point for The Rock because that was when he started becoming more of a babyface, only just to turn heel at Survivor Series. But you know he got that Shamrock. You know Shamrock was owning him in their previous feud when Rock was a heel. So Rock coming back at the end and kind of getting the better of Shamrock and Mankind uh, was all pretty fun to watch. So I was kind of low key hoping that Breakdown would win tomorrow, but y'all got to go in there and vote for Breakdown if you want to see that. It is far behind right now, 2001, no way out. But yeah, if you guys want Breakdown, go over to that Twitter poll right now. I'm sorry, not Twitter poll, YouTube poll, and vote for Breakdown. And if it wins, we'll watch it. But right, right now it's looking like we're going to be watching the three stages of hell with Austin and Triple H, was, which was not bad. It was one of my favorite matches ever in WWE. Good to see WWE, WWF fan 22 in the house as well. Appreciate the two bucks. Hey, Greg, can't wait for the watch along tomorrow. Me neither. And I love it because we're not totally sure which one we're going to do yet. Uh, Mike is in the house. Zach is here as well. And I think that does it for about, or I think that about does it for the shout outs and all of that. Cool. Um, we should get into stuff here. If you guys could do me a favor, please, and smash that thumbs up button for me. If you're watching this video right now and you're not a subscriber, please do that too. And of course, if you are a subscriber, you can take it one step further, become a channel member if you would like, or you don't have to, whatever. As long as you're here looking at me, I'm happy. And like I said, thumbs up button would be greatly appreciated. That should do it for all of the BS, the pleasantries. We can start getting into our business today. And why don't we start with... Why don't we start with Bray Wyatt? I think we should start with Bray Wyatt because that's kind of the most interesting stuff right now in WWE. And as we saw a couple of weeks ago, I think maybe it's been two weeks now, and it was during a commercial break. I want to say it was on Raw, and some fans were posting video of all of the lights going out and WWE playing the song White Rabbit by Jefferson Airplane. And 
everybody was confused as to why. What the fuck? But then they started thinking about it, putting some things together. Early speculation was this could be for Karrion Cross because he did have a white rabbit gimmick in Lucha Underground. But it seems to fit better with Bray Wyatt because Karrion Cross has already come back to the company a couple of months ago. Why are you going to bring him back just to repackage him eight weeks in? Doesn't make any sense uh, unless there's a, a tie in and there's some affiliation between Cross and Bray Wyatt. But with the red lights going down and a lot of this spooky type of stuff, plus Bray even portrayed the Mad Hatter on an episode of the Firefly Funhouse at one point, didn't he? So the White Rabbit song fits better with him, even though Cross had the name. I think some of the uh, lyrics in White Rabbit better represent uh, Bray Wyatt and, you know, the whole, you know, feed your feed your head stuff. And I think that's going to make for a really cool pro wrestling entrance, whatever it turns out to be. I can see the fans singing this song. I mean, this song's probably going to return uh, to the charts. I don't remember what, what year White Rabbit came out. I want to say 73, 74, something like that. And it's a trippy ass song. And I could see the fans singing it. I could see it becoming like a Judas. And I'm just trying to envision Bray Wyatt coming to the ring just with that song playing and some creepy-ass gimmick or whatever. That could be a lot of fun. But is it as simple as that? Is it just Bray Wyatt coming back? This is going to be his new gimmick. He's now going to be the White Rabbit or he's going to be portraying some sort of psychedelic, uh, you know, kind of trippy type of um, character. Or is it even deeper than that? And there was a really good suggestion floating around online. The person that tweeted it to me did not come up with it, but uh, so I, I don't know who to credit because uh, I will probably credit it incorrectly because I've seen it so many times now. But the idea that possibly if you look at all of the people who have recently come back to the company, what if they are all showing up first and going to form a faction with Bray Wyatt. And somebody brought up that the Firefly Funhouse can basically come to life. And Bray Wyatt, I guess, would be the, the leader. Uh, you would have Karrion Cross as the White Rabbit. You would have Scarlet as a Abby the Witch. You could have Dexter Loomis as the Buzzard because he's been acting really creepy. And don't forget, even Braun Strowman has recently come back, and Strowman has a lot of history with Bray Wyatt getting a start in the Wyatt family. So if you kind of take some of these pieces that have returned, I think the only one that really wouldn't fit there is Braun Strowman because he's kind of just being his Braun Strowman self. Uh, he's not doing anything, uh, you know, that doesn't seem too calculated. He's just going out there and murdering people and doing what he does. So even though he has a ton of history with Wyatt, I kind of feel like Strowman wouldn't be a part of that. But the Cross and Scarlet and Dexter stuff, I really like that possibility. So I don't think it would be definitely that, but something along the lines of that, where Wyatt is coming back and he's got a team with him and he's got other pe he's got other pieces in place already in there you know, proceeding with their mission unbeknownst to everybody. They're already in the company. Dexter's doing his thing. Cross and Scarlet are doing their thing. And Bray is sending out his army to kind of infiltrate before he shows up and, you know, throws everything uh, really off balance. Something like that would be a lot of fun. Of course, they've been doing all of those QR codes. They had one on Raw, which I didn't see a lot of Raw last week. But from what I understand, was it a dude in the crowd just holding up the QR code? And that QR code was, you know, something that referenced 923. And, of course, yesterday was September 23rd. And SmackDown airs from 8 o'clock to 10 o'clock on the East Coast. So a lot of people thought that on Friday at 923, at 923, we were going to see some sort of a big return or debut or maybe another clue. And I remember thinking all along, even after what we saw on Monday with the QR code, I'm like, there's no way that Bray Wyatt is going to be gone for this long and they're going to bring him back on a random September SmackDown one week after the hints start. They just started playing the White Rabbit for the audience not that long ago, just a matter of days ago. We're starting to see these little hints on TV, QR codes placed around the backstage area, maybe in the crowd, something like that. These little, this trail that they're, uh, you know, they're taking us on. I like all of that. I'm in no rush to get the payoff for that yet. So I certainly didn't think we were going to see Bray Wyatt last night, but I thought at 923, we might get some sort of another clue but there was a commercial playing at 923 so 923 had nothing to do with it at all and 923 was uh i guess just <clears throat> 
referencing something else. I guess that's what time the QR code flashed on Raw. Maybe that's what it was. So that's what the 923 was referencing. But la I'm sorry, last night on SmackDown, there was a QR code. I think it was in during the backstage segment with uh, Hit Row or whatnot. And there was a QR code there, which, of course, I've not pulled up any of these QR codes. So I'm only going by what I see, see online. Uh, but apparently in this one, you've got the coordinates to this week's Monday Night Raw. So they are going to continue this going forward, which is good. Whenever we get to the payoff here we continue getting these clues fans are going to dissect and pick apart everything and the fans are probably going to do a really good job of uh you know finding little hints and clues in these messages that are you know probably just going to add to the evidence that we already believe this is going to be bray wyatt but my big question is if this does turn out to be bray wyatt which apparently he is back training in the ring um, he's been working with somebody and he recently liked a Brody Lee tweet uh, that was, you know, kind of cryptic as well. And it just there, there's just more and more evidence that this is going to wind up being Bray Wyatt. So if we just skip all that and assume that it is going to be Bray Wyatt, how do you think he debuts and where do you think this is going to be something they're going to try to set for TV? Like, are the clues going to finally somehow give us the message that we are going to get whoever the white rabbit is on a specific date like there's no more uh questioning in it it's gonna come on this date whatever the qr code is saying i am debuting on raw on monday something like that so is it going to be on tv are they going to do it on smackdown or are they going to save this for some big championship match perhaps at crown jewel perhaps at Extreme Rules. I don't even know if I'm bringing Bray Wyatt back at Extreme Rules. I just think this should be a very, very big deal. But I don't know if you bring him back in the middle of a match so he can immediately start a program with somebody or if you just debut him fresh and let him go from there and figure out who he wants to target or feud with. So the cool thing about Bray Wyatt is we don't know what kind of character he's going to be. We don't know if he's going to be a heel or baby face. We have no fucking clue what his motives are going to be. We have no idea if he's going to be by himself or if he's going to be a member of a faction. It can literally go, and either way, this kind of guy could be a dark, scary monster. He could be a goofy Mr. Rogers type. Like I said, he could be a heel. He could be a baby face. He can do a lot of things, and he's very versatile, and it's fun knowing that somebody that a lot of fans love and miss is coming back and having literally zero clue what kind of crazy gimmick he could be a part of. All we know is it seems like it's new, it's fresh, it's going to be a new twist or a new take on Bray Wyatt, and that's all really fun. At this point, if it's not Bray Wyatt, who the hell is it? I mean, I cannot see all of this White Rabbit stuff simply for Karrion Cross, you know, unless in his strap match that he's going to have with Drew McIntyre at Extreme Rules – if the lights go down and that thing and he turns into the white rabbit to somehow <laughs> beat Drew McIntyre, I, that's the only way I could see this potentially being crossed because, you know, we did see Scarlett attempt a flash paper ball, a uh, fireball on McIntyre last night. So that combined with the, the black and white when cross attacks and stuff, there is, you know, there, there's some possibility there with those two. But I think with cross if this whole thing was just associated with him and no one else but him i think the fans might look at that as a disappointment nothing against cross but what he's doing is fine you know you're doing all of this tease just to add another element to this already existing character when we all thought it was going to be a bray wyatt return that's why i think the more and more you look at this there's really only one way it can go i just believe it's going to be bray, bray wyatt so that's when you have to just wonder when he's going to turn up, how long the clues are going to last, how many hints they give us on TV, and how much shit we have to follow until we get to this inevitable payoff of a, of a debut or a return or whatever we're going to see. And where he's going to land, if he's going to be a Raw guy, if he's going to be a SmackDown guy, I think it would be really cool on Raw anyway if he showed up on Raw or any if he had some sort of uh, affiliation with Raw to somehow address the Alexa Bliss situation because she has just been a shell of her former self. I know the Lily Dolls are doing very well. She did the therapy sessions to try to deprogram her from her dark, uh, you know, the, the dark spell that she went through when she was with Bray Wyatt. And then she did the deal, deal at WrestleMania that year. That turned out to be Bray Wyatt's last match, I believe. And she kind of turned on him with no explanation. And... Now she's kind of being back to regular Alexa. 
only she still has the Lily doll. And if you do bring Bray Wyatt back and he's on Raw in any capacity, I don't know how you don't at least address Alexa Bliss. Triple H doesn't seem like the type of guy that likes to pretend shit didn't happen. So I think even Triple H would say, you know, if uh, Bray is on Raw, I can't just have him pass cross paths with Alexa Bliss in the hallway and not say anything to her. There's a huge history between these two. And, you know, Alexa, when she kind of associated herself with Bray, many people argue that was the best work and the most interesting she was in her entire career, which I think is ironic that she was doing the best work of her career then. But the minute Bray Wyatt left, she was reduced to, you know, just even less than what she was before, which it really shouldn't work that way. Usually a, a gimmick, you know, a career defining gimmick should launch you, not, you know, not lower you. So I think maybe this could be a potential for her as well, because like I said, Alexa Bliss just feels very bland. She feels like, I mean, aside from that doll, maybe part of it is the music too. I think her music is atrocious. Um, maybe she should go back to her old music or try to recapture some of that old Alexa Bliss. It would be cool if she started doing that right before why it comes back like if they do some sort of a weird segment where she just decides to go back to old Alexa Bliss comes out to the old music fans are excited to see her back that way only for her to then be confronted by Bray Wyatt or something in her darker past and that could be fun but right now they're just parading around on TV with that doll because it sells but uh, Alexa Bliss I believe needs to be doing more uh, in my mind based on what she's you know already done in the company so We'll see what they wind up doing with Bray Wyatt, but that entire situation is really interesting, and we'll have to watch Raw this week to see what additional cues or clues, excuse me, they wind up giving us. And I'm sure it's going to be another code that's going to take us right to SmackDown and just keep us following along. But I feel like uh, something that definitely has time, energy, and money put into it. I mean, if they paid. Uh, you know, for the rights to license White Rabbit, that means they're not playing any games here. And uh, WWE, Triple H might be more likely to do this, but WWE in the past hasn't really been one to spend money on music unless you're a megastar, if you're a CM Punk or a Ronda Rousey or something like that. So if they're willing to, uh, you know, spend this money and put this work in creatively, I think a big part of that is also making sure you unveil this entire new story gimmick character faction whatever it is at the right time when it can make the biggest splash and not just randomly unannounced in the middle of raw that's going head to head with two monday night football games you know what i mean so i think it's you got to pick your spot here and uh, something like this might be best saved for pay-per-view so extreme rules is coming up we'll have to see if uh, that turns out to be the spot we're going to talk about cm punk next but first let me just uh knock out couple of more super chats before we get going also want to say hello to spaz phoenix chiming in youtube says we're family now damn right spaz work we are tga gaming sean ireland is in the house as well good to see you and two more bucks from wwe fan i liked bray wyatt's theme before his release the fiend theme was great i loved it i thought it was a really good theme um i just don't know if they're going to bring the fiend back i don't know if the fiend is going to be part of this you know bray wyatt if he does come back as a completely new character as the white rabbit then you know he's got wyatt family bray he's got funhouse bray he's got muscle man bray or whatever he did in the funhouse match with john cena and of course he's got the fiend and now this he could have you know there could be four faces of wyatt five faces of wyatt even uh if you add them all up so you know in a lot of ways that's an interesting legacy to make for yourself is to have several successful very different gimmicks and we will see if any of his old and previous gimmicks are tied or sewn into what he's going to be doing uh, when he does uh, inevitably return like we believe he will so i am interested to see what happens i'm a big jefferson airplane fan so i got no problem with them playing white rabbit i kind of think that's pretty cool uh, for wwe doing something like that just uh it's kind of not like them you know what i mean uh divine ricks appreciate five more bucks from you hey greg do you think the bloodline is going to be in war games at for at survivor series if so who do you think their opponents are going to be thank you for that i forgot to put war games in my notes holy shit uh yeah it was announced that survivor series this year will have a couple of war games matches i believe a men's war games match and a women's war games match and i think this is superb i was a big fan 
of the War Games concept in WCW. I thought it was cool that WWE resurrected an NXT after it had been pitched on the main roster for many years. Vince apparently had rejected it several times. So for them to bring it back to the NXT roster, I thought was perfect the way NXT used to be with the black and gold. I'm like, this is the type of talent to have a War Games match in. And they had great War Games matches. I attended one of them live in 2018 before Survivor Series uh, at NXT War Games. And I think that had a Aleister Black and uh, Johnny Gargano championship match on it. It was a great pay-per-view and a great War Games match. And all of them that they've done in NXT have been great. But since NXT underwent their you know, kind of brand change to 2.0. Granted, they're kind of going to the 3.0 now. Oh, now uh, I feel like the war games matches that they already had in that brand are going to be really, really tough to top. Now that Vince is gone, Triple H is back. You got Survivor Series sitting here that we've all been wondering about because there is no point to Survivor Series. There really isn't. The previous Survivor Series, so I live really close to like a military base and they have been testing fighter jets for the past few days and it is so loud i don't know if you guys can hear it they fly right over my house freaking nuts it's been going on for days anyway uh, we have survivor series on the calendar they've been doing this ridiculous brand supremacy bullshit which doesn't even make sense because nobody's really that exclusive to one brand and if you are a wwe wrestler there is zero point for in fighting for your brand there's no point in fighting for Raw or SmackDown. It's stupid, and it was pretty pointless even when you had a somewhat stable brand split, so to speak, but it's even more ridiculous now. There's no reason for any of these talents to be on one specific team when they're both crisscrossing shows anyway. It was kind of interesting in recent years the way they would do the champion versus champion thing, but even that is going to be difficult to do. If you're going to have Roman holding both belts, what's he going to do? Go in the ring and just wrestle himself? So basically, you have a pay-per-view on the schedule coming up in November where you normally have your two world title or your two world champions face each other. You can't do that. And you normally have matches Raw versus SmackDown, which is kind of stupid to do that since everybody is on Raw and SmackDown these days anyway. You see very little, uh, you know, uh, of people staying put. You always have appearances on the other show, and there's not much of a brand split at all right now. So you've got Survivor Series coming up that you that's completely pointless. If you're Triple H, or so you're looking at this and saying, well, what the hell are we going to do? Raw versus SmackDown is pointless. Roman can't wrestle himself. War Games. He's been wanting to do it. There's no better pay-per-view to do War Games on than Survivor Series. I think it's a perfect replacement. Survivor Series... Dates way back to 1987 as being the, the team atmosphere, and that's what War Games always was. War Games and, uh, you know, Survivor Series have both ran in November, I think, and, you know, way back in the day uh, at certain times as well. And it's the one team aspect of WCW that can be incorporated into WWE. And I like that so much better than the five-on-five -five tags or whatever. This is going to make it so much more fun and I'm curious what they're going to do around the war games matches and who's going to be in the war games matches the bloodline absolutely has to be one of the teams in the war games so of the four teams we're going to see two women's two men's bloodline is going to be one of them who is the bloodline going to face shit man it could be a team of McIntyre and, and Drew and or I'm sorry McIntyre and Owens and Sammy you guys can throw out some other suggestions but the bloodline is going to have to face somebody the women it's probably going to be maybe damage control, even though there's only three of them. Uh, but I feel like Sasha and Naomi could come back. You get Charlotte back in the mix here as well. Uh, so I feel like it's going to be Bailey and her crew with some sort of a combination of probably Bianca, probably Charlotte, maybe Becky Lynch, depending on what her injury status is. I'm not sure. But either way, I think it's great that they are going to uh, be doing war games at Survivor Series. And it's just a perfect, it's a perfect thing to incorporate into Survivor Series since Survivor Series is kind of sitting there as a pointless pay-per-view anyway. And I would love to see Survivor Series carry on a new tradition after 35 years, you know? So maybe it's time. And if war games is a success this year, this is something that they can do every year at Survivor Series. And I think would really help fans be more interested in Survivor Series because for as long as I've been doing YouTube, Survivor Series has been a bad pay-per-view. 
I attended Survivor Series in 2018. It was great. That Brian Danielson and Brock Lesnar match was fun. Uh, but I remember a lot of years prior to that, 2014 specifically kind of stands out. Maybe 2013 does as well as some really, really bad shows and pointless shows. And if you make Survivor Series centered around war games now, I think that can really, uh, you know, make people give a shit about Survivor Series again and maybe make for some uh, pretty memorable moments and having your first War Games match in WWE. I think part of the reason why they avoided doing War Games in the past was because they already had a Hell in the Cell, which had a top on it, and War Games, of course, had a top. But the NXT version, we know, did not have a top on it, and I have a feeling that WWE's version will be the same way. I don't think they're going to enclose the combatants in there. I think you're going to want to get up to the top and do some stuff and do some dives and shit like that. So I think it's going to probably be the NXT-style War Games cage at Survivor Series. But when you have already the Hell in the Cell and then you created that ridiculous Elimination Chamber, which I think was kind of WWE's version of a War Games, you have too many cages with ceilings on it. And I can understand not bringing in War Games in the past. Uh, I would have just not created the Elimination Chamber and done War Games instead or something like that. But now that it's several years later, trying War Games on the main roster I think can be a lot of fun, especially if you've got Roman in the bloodline in the first ever you know WWE War Games match uh, on the main roster. It's going to be great. So yeah, Survivor Series War Games is going to be awesome. Ram Viniero, thank you for the two bucks as well. Oh, I lost you. There it is. What's up, Greg? Cheers to you, man. Cheers to you. Appreciate you being here. And Spaz Phoenix chiming in with a nice $10 drop. Provided Trips and Punk can bury the hatchet. Can you imagine? Cody wins the Rumble. Punk returns after the match. Punk versus Cody, night one of Mania for the chance to fight Roman on night two. Uh, that is going to have to be whether Triple H is going to have to decide if he wants publicity over locker room happiness. Because as great as that would be to see Punk come into the WWE after everything that happened in, in AEW and the way our eyes would just be so wide, if I'm sitting there on the WWE roster and Triple H brings in this guy that had nothing but trouble in the other company, he comes right in the door, he leapfrogs everybody to a main event payoff at WrestleMania. I don't care how great the buzz would be and I don't care... Uh, you know, how many people it would get talking. I think out of principle, I just wouldn't do that. Why would you reward that type of behavior? Is that going to, is what's going to, what would that type of reward? Hey, punk, come work with us. We'll give you $10 million and you'll wrestle at the main event of WrestleMania. Uh, do you think punk's going to have any uh, doubts in his mind, whether or not he did the right thing at all out, or if maybe he should cool it and you know, cool his jets a little bit when he gets so angry and lashes out and yells at everybody, telling him that that's okay to do. I'm not sure if that's the message I want to send. Plus, you're going to really be pissing some people off in that WWE locker room if a scenario like that happened. But it sure would be fun to come up on YouTube and talk about it. So, uh, and it would help my channel as well, <laughs> garner some views and attention if I come up here and say, holy shit, CM Punk just showed up in WWE. Uh, so I certainly wouldn't be against it, but I think if I was in WWE, I'd be very much against it if I was a uh, you know member of the roster there. Uh, Thomas, appreciate the five bucks from you. Happy to see Soraya back in the wrestling, but part of me is a little bummed. She didn't come back to WWE where the better women's division is. Yeah, it's a shame because she tried to come back and then she got that injury and uh, she's been on the no touch list ever since so i think if soraya or Paige was medically cleared she never got injured and she's been active this whole time i don't think wwe would let her go i think she'd have a pretty good i think she'd be of the level of a becky or a sasha or a bailey or a charlotte i think she'd be up there with them in terms of you know how decorated she is and even though she might have some instances of frustration just like sasha banks did i think all in all she would uh be one of the top uh women of all time in the company so it's a it's a shame that she didn't stay there but i don't really think she could because she couldn't wrestle and then wwe was fucking with her with the with the twitch stuff and yeah it was probably best for Paige just to go but I hope she's happy, and we'll be interested to see if she does wind up wrestling. We'll talk about that here in a minute. And uh, five more from you, Tomas. Thank you very much. I've been trying to become a family member, but every time I click on the link, it takes me to a weird Minecraft video. What? The one below? I don't know what to tell you there, dude. 
We got any Minecraft stuff coming up? Let me look. No Minecraft for me. I don't know what is, what you're clicking on. I don't know, dude. Uh, but good luck with that. I hope you don't have any more Minecraft problems. That's funny. Longboard. You're in the danger zone. Yeah. Danger zone. Yeah, the volume is too low. I don't think you guys are right about any of this. Volume is fine. Just turn your volume up. I got the volume set, what I always have it on. Mic is on. There are no problems. There's no Minecraft over here. Maybe you guys got some crazy internets or computers or something. I don't know. Uh, but Tomas, uh, I will uh, DM you or we will work it out soon. All right, right on. Did I hit all of the other ones? I think we're I think we're good. Okay, let's move on now to CM Punk. That's what I wanted to talk about next. And that is, uh, this is mostly just speculation. This is mostly coming just from Wade Keller, who speculated in the latest PW Torch, that CM Punk is likely going to get some sort of a contract buyout from AEW. He comes to this reasoning based on Dynamite when... Ian uh, Riccoboni was running through the previous Ring of Honor champions during the Claudio and Chris Jericho match, and he listed them all with one specific exception. No mention of Mr. Phil Brooks, CM Punk, as a former Ring of Honor champion. That led Wade to speculate that if you put all these things together, you listen to the latest stories, and, you know, of course, there's still the investigation that's going to determine whatever it's going to determine, and some more accounts in-person accounts of the brawl itself a lot of people backing off the claim now that the bucks kicked in the door most people are of the belief that the door was not kicked in and that cm punk did in fact throw the first punch fifle select had a pretty good write-up on this as well where they did note and mention that it's still unclear whether cm punk threw the first punch out of legit fear for his safety because if that's the case then it turns into a self-defense issue and that sort of thing but from all accounts and eyewitness reports, you know, the Bucks and Kenny went in there with the head of legal with them. So that doesn't seem like a bunch of guys that's, that's in there looking for a fight when, you, you know, you've got an executive in the company that's in charge of the legal stuff coming in there with you as a witness just to be there. And Punk starts throwing punches. And that's where the melee happened. And that's when Tony Khan had to strip everybody, make, you know, some blanket suspensions across the board. And then as the investigation concludes, you can start bringing and people back in based on you know whatever the investigation uncovers and the more of this that you read it's just starting to look more and more like cm punk is probably going to be gone from aew and i agree completely with wade keller in his speculation because i think that if you're aew and if you're tony khan it's best to move past this a lot of people are of the belief and i am too but a lot of people say, oh, good mic work. Don't you think that these should, these guys should all get in a room and hash things out and then go make some money with it? Yes, of course I do. But you have to understand that would be true with any group of wrestlers, I believe, in the world. You can probably have any group of people get in a fight. And if they're over enough and it gets enough buzz, I think everybody will not be stupid enough to hold those grudges. will come together and say, hey, let's get paid here. But one of these personalities is CM Punk. And CM Punk trumps everything. He's different, and he is somebody that really struggles to get along in these situations. And I think anybody else other than CM Punk could say, okay, yes, let's capitalize on it. But I think CM Punk is so fucking stubborn, and he's really, really set in his ways, and he's really hardcore that I just don't see him basically being able to put his shit aside. I just don't think he has that ability. I don't think he has that capability to do that. And he's just one personality that's just, uh, you know, that's just a little bit too abrasive for something like that. We've seen Brett and Sean do it. We've seen Matt Hardy and Edge do it. We've seen Eddie Kingston and Sammy Guevara do it even most recently. We've seen plenty of instances in the past. Uh, Booker T and Batista, Ric Flair and McFoley. You can, you can think of some more. We, we've had plenty of instances in the past where there's been real-life beef that is brought out onto TV to make money. But this is a little bit, uh, I think, too serious. Uh, what CM Punk did at the media scrum, whether he was right to be pissed or not, because a lot of people are like, oh, he had every right to say that shit because Hangman went into business for himself. No. Whatever you think was done by the Bucks or Kenny or Hangman Page, even if that was true, it's still 
is not as bad as what CM Punk did and how bad he made the company look, how bad he made his boss look, and how unprofessional he came off in that scrum, eating his muffin, bitching about everybody, you know, calling one of the top wrestlers in the company an empty-headed fuck and saying, I'm hurt and I'm tired and I'm old and I work with fucking children. I'm like, bitch, you took 10 years off. 10 years off, nine years off. Kevin Nash called him out for this same exact thing on his podcast this week as well. He goes, man, I was he was when I was doing that promo with Punk on Raw, where Punk said, oh, I thought you were dead, LOL. Yeah, I was in my 50s. You know, Punk's 42, 43, and he just took eight, nine years off, and he's complaining that he's old and sore. I'm like, you've had a decade to recoup. You've been back for one year. You're, you're, you're speaking as if you've had a 30-year career, and you're working with a bunch of immature idiots, uh, you know, who are just driving you crazy, and you're just fed up because you've been wrestling for 30 years straight. No, you've been wrestling for 365 days. That's it. You've been back in the company for a year. And you're acting as if you've had the hardest, longest career of all time. All the, the angles that he's done and the matches he had during that year were great. And, you know, for him to, you know, come off, you know, in that way just made the company look like shit. And Tony Khan has professed his love publicly for CM Punk before. And I think even Tony Khan's, you know, probably realizing now that you don't have to put all your stock in one person. You don't have to have... Uh, and you don't have to publicly announce that to everybody either, because from the moment he started doing that, that's when it seemed like some of these problems with CM Punk were starting. So when you think about what went on, when you thought, when you think about the fight backstage, and some of these issues are probably not going to be able to be resolved. CM Punk is a very stubborn person. He seems like somebody to me, based on how we've seen CM Punk behave in the past, that in his in his head right now at home he's sitting there rehabbing his injury he probably is of the belief that he is 1000 percent in the right he had every right to be that way those guys are assholes and fuck them he probably feels no remorse he probably does not feel bad for the position he put the company in or tony khan in i could be wrong about this it's just that's the way i feel like like cm punk doesn't seem like he's the type of guy who's going to go home and say you know what i was wrong that was really fucked up of me i have completely ruined my return to wrestling. I have, uh, you know, ruined potential future business for AEW. I put all of my coworkers in the locker room in a tight spot. I am now, uh, you know, I've completely uh, overshadowed the return of MJF. My situation and the situation with the elite is all anybody is talking about online. And he probably doesn't even feel bad about that at all. Now, if he did, and he wants to go out of his way to try to make amends. Hey, I still think what you guys did to me was fucked up, but I will admit that maybe I shouldn't have said what I said. You know, maybe that can still all happen. It's just who we have known CM Punk to be. He doesn't seem like that type of guy. He seems like a guy who sticks to his guns and is stubborn as all hell and is not going to admit fault in much. You know what I mean? And that's only I'm only saying that based on what we've heard him say. <laughs> I'm, I'm only basing it on his interviews and how he's spoken on camera about certain situations. I've very rarely heard CM Punk say, you know, I made a big mistake one time. I went to a show and I did this. And when I got home, I felt really bad about it. And I texted so-and-so and I apologized. When have you ever heard him say anything like that? So I just think that based on who CM Punk is and based on the problems and the trouble that he has caused in that company, it is best for all parties for him to go. I even think this should be kind of a quietly done thing because if Tony Khan was just a straight up fire CM Punk, that's where you could have the possibility of some lawsuits and stuff. And we have heard that, you know, lawsuits are not out of the question here. I'm really hoping it doesn't get to the point where we've got, you know, we're going to have trials and you know courtroom hearings with the bucks and cm punk and all this shit i really doesn't i hope really hope it doesn't turn into people you know getting sued i hope cm punk doesn't sue for wrongful termination that's why i don't think that tony khan is just going to flat out release or fire cm punk i think there's going to have to be some sort of a settlement or some sort of a contract buyout to avoid any litigation down the line so when wade keller mentioned a contract buyout i'm like that seems like the most makes the most sense you know because tony khan even if tony khan is pissed at cm punk and says i don't want to pay this motherfucker any more money after what he did but it's probably worth the money to pay him to get him out of your life 
instead of, you know, releasing him or firing him. And then he goes, no, wait a minute. These guys came into my locker room. I feared for my life. I was just defending myself. Then you've got lawyers. Then you've got witnesses being brought to the stand. And then you've got, you know, potentially even more division, more turmoil, more stress and drama in your locker room that you just don't need. So I think it's probably best for AEW's sake that, yes, it's a shame that CM Punk's, you know, run didn't work out with them but as we've seen even though brawl out is only what three weeks old at this point the ratings have done just fine the interest has been just fine without cm punk cm punk was a big shot in the arm for them yes but we've seen that they can carry on just fine without them that's always been the case and we've heard other stories, you know, about locker room morale and energy really being high. Everybody is in a much better place than where they were a few weeks ago. Uh, you know, even Tony Khan's demeanor perhaps changing a little bit. And this being a big, big learning experience for him because Tony Khan, rightfully so, drew a lot of criticism for his handling of this and how he sat there during that scrum and just allowed CM Punk to say all that stuff without stepping in and being a boss. Now it looks like he's got to do that. Now it looks like he's saying, oh, okay, I'm never going to do that again. Don't wear your heart on your sleeve. You're the owner. You're the, you're the man in charge here. You cannot go out and do some of these things. This is something that he's going to learn uh, as he grows and matures. And already in his very short three-year run as a wrestling promoter, he's dealt with a very, very serious and traumatic situation backstage that is only going to give him experience for the future to make sure, number one, that never happens again. And number two, if it does, make sure he handles it in the right way because – as badly as all that CM Punk stuff went down and as horrible as he made the company look and as how Bush League that whole thing looked, since then, they've been anything but Bush League. They stripped who they needed to strip, suspended who they needed to suspend. They're undergoing an investigation, and it looks like uh, they're prepared to cut ties with CM Punk completely if that's what it takes. So from uh, from Brawl Out up until this point, I think they've been handling things very well. To bring and reintroduce CM Punk back into this locker room now, is it worth it? Is it worth it? No, not to me, not to me. So if this winds up being the case, like I said, if I'm Tony Khan, this is something I'm quietly doing. I'm not going to, you know, they'll probably issue some sort of a company statement, I imagine, but, uh, or, you know, maybe there could be a gag order or something like that. But I think there needs to be, in my opinion, for this situation to just get resolved and for everybody to move forward, I think there needs to be a contract buyout Maybe CM Punk will be forced to not go on another podcast and spill the beans. Maybe there will be a gag order there or an agreement or a settlement. I don't know. But I think if there's a way to just buy Punk out of his contract to ensure that, number one, he's gone, and number two, it's all over with and there's not going to be any future litigation or lawsuits being filed or anything like that, and AEW and Tony Khan are somehow able to escape this situation with no legal liability, no lawsuits, no court appearances, no nothing, Kenny and the Bucks all come back, and the only piece that they lost from this was CM Punk, a piece that, in retrospect, retrospect probably shouldn't have been there from the beginning. And uh, that's that's the way I feel about it. I kind of think that's the way it should go as well. Now, if this all happens and CM Punk does get a contract buyout, I would imagine that there probably isn't any sort of a no-compete clause listed in there. Plus, he's injured. He's not going to be competing for a while anyway. Does he go back to WWE? Uh, like I said earlier, I would I would say no. I would vote no on that. Um, bringing him back into WWE after everything that happened in AEW just to get buzz, you know, and just to get people talking and just to maybe one-up AEW, I don't think is worth the damage it could potentially do uh, to your locker room. Triple H and Punk aren't exactly best friends either. And there's probably a lot of people in the WWE locker room that would not want Punk there. There's probably plenty of them that like him and are friends with him, but there's also probably plenty that are would be like, I don't want this guy to come in here and then leapfrog me and take opportunities away from me and everybody else that's been around here working hard. You know, and then come in and work our, win our title and then get in a fight with us backstage. Like, nobody's going to want that. I just don't see that being likely. I only see it being like likely as if uh, WWE really just wants to stick it to AEW and allow CM Punk to come out and cut a pipe bomb on them like X-Pac did when he you know came back to WWE after being in WCW. I don't know, but I think it would be really, really far-fetched for CM Punk to come back to WWE, especially being involved in any, anything major. Is CM Punk going to come back and beat Roman Reigns? I fucking hope not. So I, I just don't think that would be fair. 
to be honest. So we will see uh, what the future holds for CM Punk and his relationship with AEW. But uh, from where we sit today, uh, it looks like that relationship is going to be dead. And we probably may never see CM Punk wrestle again. How weird would that be if he never came back? I mean, he's already 43. He seems to hold grudges for a long time. If he waits another eight years, he's going to be 51. And the dude is already uh, not very athletic as it is. How is he going to look in eight more years? So I feel like his window is closing. And based on how he went out, you talk about going out in a blaze of glory. Holy shit. Winning the title and having a complete meltdown backstage and getting canned the next day. Nuts, man. Who uh, That shit wasn't on my bingo card. That's for sure. Speaking of backstage stuff i guess in aew uh, malachi black apparently is still internally listed or still under contract to aew he was reportedly given and granted a conditional release by the company but there's a lot of speculation as to what is in this conditional release many people assume he's got a no compete there that prevents him from going back to wwe for a long time uh, malachi also uh, issued a pretty big statement on social media where he spoke about issues with his mental health his personal life uh, his marriage even though he said his marriage is fine the you know the stress on the the relationship because of their jobs has played a role and he even mentioned something about professional promises that went unfulfilled. So it seems like some of that could have been how he felt about WWE, but maybe he felt like he was promised some things in AEW that hasn't gone very well either. And I think with the House of Black, I thought the gimmick was, uh, or the, the faction was very good. It's still going to continue without him in AEW. And I thought at least he had something to do. But Malachi, even when he was in WWE, I've always felt that this guy should be contending for a world title so when he got to aew i'm like okay cool they will use him because vince didn't know what to do with him and even though they gave malachi a really cool faction and he's been doing some pretty cool things and you know associated with some pretty big names in the business he hasn't been wrestling a ton been in a lot of, of uh you know uh, multi-man matches and doesn't seem like he's a really credible threat for the world title uh in aew at the moment but that doesn't mean that that can't come down the line but once the regime change happened in WWE, it was kind of reported that Malachi really wished he was back there. And I think he wanted to go back right away. And that's when we talked about a couple of weeks ago, now that we are thankfully in a society that actually does take things like mental health seriously. And that's good. We should, because it's very important to have good mental health. And if you don't, it can really affect you personally, professionally, it can affect your whole life. And these aren't things that people really gave a shit about 10, 20, 30 years ago. So the fact that now we are living in a world where, you know, these things can be dealt with, I think that's very positive. However, I wonder, you know, and I'm not saying Malachi is doing this, but you know, if some talent, now that you have two companies, if you're trying to get out of one contract, you know, maybe you go to the extreme. Hey, I'm having some serious mental health things and I want out of my contract. I believe in both companies, as long as you're not a major star, as long as you're not a Randy Orton or Roman Reigns, you know, or, you know, maybe a John Moxley. I think that if you want out, you should be let out. I mean, if you're a mid-level star, if, if Riddick, if Mad Cat Moss just decides he wants out of his WWE contract, they should let him go. I think Madcap's got great potential and everything, but WWE will be just fine without Madcap Moss. If he wants to go, let him go. You know, when your big name talents come to you, then maybe that's one thing. But when it comes to anybody in either company, if Malachi wants to go, even though he's under contract for five years, uh, if he goes and approaches Tony Khan and just says, I just don't want to be here anymore, I would like to leave, then I think Tony Khan should let him go. But you also have to understand that this is a business as well. And Tony Khan knows if I let you go, you're going to go right over to WWE. You'll be on their show tomorrow. So I don't want to let that happen either. So we got to work something out. All right, I'll let you go out. Of, I'll let you out of your contract, but you can't compete for a year. You know, is that what he says? Or maybe it's six months, whatever it is. I mean, Renee Paquette, Renee Young famously had a really long no compete after she left WWE. It might still be in. It might still be uh, in effect. I'm not sure. Uh, but she couldn't go anywhere for a long time. And so maybe it's something like that with Malachi, but he, uh, we may not see him for a while. We just wish him the best. I just hope that he remains happy. I hope he takes this time to, you know, fix himself and get himself straight mentally and physically because it takes a lot to do this. And we all know his wife, Zelina, is in WWE. And if he's able to go back there and sign and go back to the WWE, that would be great for him. I would feel much more confident with Triple H 
you know, in charge of creative on the main roster, I feel much more confident with Alistair Black's uh, progress uh, as opposed to Vince. So if Black went back to WWE, I would expect good things for him. So we'll see what the future is for Malachi Black, but I think it's going to be a while before we see him turn up uh, anywhere else. Perhaps Tommy End could show up back on the Indies or something like that, but in terms of a major promotion, I'm sure if Tony Khan is going to let him go, there has to be some sort of a language or some sort of language in there that's going to prevent him from going to WWE as another very loud fighter jet flies over. So uh, we'll keep our eye on that. But there were also some reports in AEW of other AEW talent contacted by WWE over the past few weeks. And during this time, there was a few potential names talked about. One of them was uh, FTR, uh, potentially recontacted by WWE to go back there. Of course, they had a lot of success in NXT under Triple H and attempts to re-sign them back when they were the revival before they left the company, failed. They went to AEW. They've been piling up belts there, and we'll see if they ever do uh, make their way back to WWE. They did post out a tweet today. One of them did uh, with all their championships, and they said something like, we're winding down, but there's still much to do. So I don't know what winding down means. They're still very young. I don't know why they think their tag team run would be winding down unless their run in AEW is winding down. I don't know. Uh, so I think FTR, they're my favorite tag team in wrestling. I would really hate for them to leave AEW and go back to WWE, but perhaps they will. Also, a uh, funny story about Bobby Fish. Apparently, uh, according to uh, the Wrestling Observer uh, newsletter, Ryan Frederick points out that Bobby Fish had apparently and reportedly asked Kyle O'Reilly and Adam Cole to ask for the release so they could go back to WWE. They both declined. Of course, Kyle O'Reilly, I believe, is uh, recovering from neck fusion surgery, and Adam Cole has had a concussion, and the entire uh, undisputed coming to AEW was a big flop. And, of course, Bobby Fish has been very outspoken about CM Punk, had a lot to say about Punk when he left, even challenging him to, like, an MMA fight, and is just running his mouth a lot, and he has publicly stated how much he loves and respects Triple H. But since his Undisputed Era cohorts have elected not to ask for their release and to stay with AEW, this kind of leaves him by himself wondering if he could get back into WWE. Many people thought he would turn back up in NXT, maybe be associated with uh, Roderick Strong in some way, or perhaps go back and be a coach in NXT. Well, last night at Victory Road, apparently Impact's holding pay-per-views on Friday nights now, Bobby Fish debuted in Impact, cut a promo, Dropped a lot of hints, definitely took a couple digs at CM Punk and uh, talked about all the legit people in the locker room, and he's now in Impact to start doing his thing there. So uh, Bobby Fish is in Impact. I don't think this is going to be signed any sort of long-term deal there. I think he even said in his promo that he's not under contract to them, but he is going to be making some appearances at least in Impact Wrestling, and we'll have to wait and see if he winds up uh, coming back in uh, to WWE or not. Gabe Sapolsky according to PW Insider, is also back working in the company in a creative capacity. No word yet, I don't think, uh, if he's going to be working in NXT or if he's going to be working with uh, Triple H on the main roster. But Gabe's cool. He's a friend of ours. We've talked to him a few times. I think he follows me on Twitter, and he's had a lot of history in the business as well, uh, especially you know back in uh, uh, you know the Ring of Honor days too. So Triple H bringing him back in. Uh, is interesting, and Gabe noted on Twitter that he will still be doing his uh, Twitter spaces for independent wrestlers that he does to help them out, and none of that is going to change for him. But he does have this uh, new job now back uh, in WWE, so good for him, and welcome back. Also, uh, we should talk about uh, Soraya, like I said, a.k.a. Paige, who did make her AEW debut this past week at Dynamite Grand Slam. But as we saw, when she got in the ring, she did not get physical with anybody. She just basically backed off all the heels, and she is going to be making some comments on Wednesday. Now, there was a report by Dave Meltzer who said that she has not been cleared to return to the ring. Doctors have not cleared her. That makes sense. She did not get physical when she debuted. But then Soraya did tweet saying, don't believe everything you read in the dirt sheets or something to that effect. So whenever a talent doesn't like what they read, it's always the dirt sheets. Well, Meltzer you know, I think it's pretty safe to say that he's pretty clued into what's going on in AEW. Every single wrestling fan out there that doesn't like Dave Meltzer accuses of him being an AEW shill and whatnot. So if that's really the case, then I believe Dave knows what's going on in AEW. And he's got his, uh, you know, 
Uh, he's got his ear to the ground with them a lot. He knows what's going on there. And it's not like Dave is some Joe Schmo wrestling YouTuber reporting nonsense. This is Dave Meltzer. So I don't really consider him just to be, I know that he speculates a lot and he editorializes a lot in his comments and stuff. But, you know, if he's reporting that page is uncleared, I don't know why you just pull that out of your ass and just say that. You know what I mean? So Soraya claims that don't believe everything you read and that she will be on Dynamite on Wednesday and they have advertised her. We will hear from Soraya and maybe in that interview or whatever it is she reveals what she's going to be doing there i really hope she's not coming in just to manage the kabuki warriors hopefully she's doing something a little bit more in aew and if she's going to be working with doctors you know when she cites people like brian danielson and edge who both came back from you know career threatening or uh, ending injuries she feels like she could do that too and i hope that she does if she is able to get in the ring and wrestle that would be huge for AEW so hopefully she will be I think they should do I put this on Twitter today I think they should do like a backstage interview with her like next time she's on TV and she's doing an interview backstage with Tony Schiavone I want to hear like John Silver or somebody in the background yell out Paige how are you doing and then Silver runs up and then Hangman comes into frame he hugs John Silver and the two of them walk away and Soraya just looks at him and just says just shrugs her shoulders and continues on with her promo. Something like that would be pretty fun. Or maybe it could be uh, Stokely yelling Page, and he's yelling to Ethan, Lim Ethan Page. Could be something like that. I think that would be fun. Just a little nink, wink and a nod uh, to her former gimmick would be fun. But we will uh, keep our eye on uh, Soraya and see what she's going to wind up doing in AEW. I did mention AEW Grand Slam this past Wednesday. We watched that together. They pulled in just over a million uh, viewers for this week in the ratings, and that is down just a bit uh, from the pretty good uh, number, the 1.1 plus that they brought in the week before, but still keeping it over 1 million. And I think they've uh, had what three, three or four weeks in a row where they've carried over a million viewers, which is pretty decent. Raw this week only had 1.59, 1.6, so they're only about 500,000 away there from Raw's rating. Although Raw did go up against two NFL football games, and Raw is going to see a dip in the fall because of NFL, so uh, you can't really compare that too much raw is just going to be low all the way through uh the end of the year and then they'll probably pick back up and really see an increase when we get into wrestlemania season because you're gonna have monday night football ending at the same time royal rumble and wrestlemania season is starting and you're gonna see a huge uptick in the raw rating uh in 2023 faux show but dynamite still pulled in a solid rating with some big matches on wednesday i really enjoyed wednesday more than last night last night had like 47 matches past Packed in to that two hour rampage where on Wednesday, I believe we only had five and we saw Chris Jericho win the Ring of Honor title in the opener uh, against Claudio, which is great. His number Ocho his eighth world title. A lot of fans unhappy about it. I'm not whatever. It's a little feather in his cap. Uh, Maybe, you know, once Ring of Honor starts you know, to get a streaming deal or start running, you know, some shows, then you can do whatever. But Jericho is a guy that really helped get AEW started. So maybe he can be champion when Ring of Honor launches. And then maybe an old Ring of Honor original or somebody that with a lot of Ring of Honor history can be the person to beat Jericho for that title. That would be fun. But I have no issue with Jericho winning the Ring of Honor title. I don't think it's a disgrace at all. I think it's perfectly fine. And it's not something that I'm going to get my panties in a bunch over. Also, we did see the acclaimed win the tag team titles. They had their great moment. That was awesome. And Moxley, of course, beating Brian Danielson in the main event. And uh, I stand corrected. I didn't shut up about how I thought Danielson was going to be the guy. He had to be the guy. He's the only choice. He's the only choice. He's the only choice, said Greg. <laughs> it's got to be Danielson for all of the reasons that I pointed out. But while I was pointing out all of those reasons, I was making it clear every time that even though I'm predicting Danielson to win, even though I think Danielson should win, even though I think he's the best choice, if it turns out to be Moxley, I would be an idiot for complaining about that because Moxley has had a hell of a run. He had a better summer of Punk than Punk could have dreamed of. He wrestled every week. He was unbelievably active, wrestled hard, bled hard, and left it all out there in the ring every night, whether he was defending the title or not. And he was the epitome of what a champion should be. So if they wanted to go back to Moxley, I would look like a shithead if I sat here and complained about that. So I have no issue with Moxley winning the title at all. I'm a big Moxley fan. I think aside from Roman, he's, you know, doing the best work in all of wrestling right now. 
and I think Moxley is a bona fide juggernaut, and I got no issue with him being champion. But I also thought it would have been cool to see Danielson win the title. Doesn't look like the AEW title is going to be in Brian Danielson's immediate future unless they want to continue something with Moxley, but that was a pretty straightforward victory. Daniel Cena even congratulated him and put the belt on him after the match, so all seems well in Blackpool Combat Club, but now I wonder, with Jericho winning the Ring of Honor title, I thought Danielson was going to win the AEW title. He did not. Do you think maybe he tar- targets Jericho? Because for all the all the people complaining about Jericho winning the Ring of Honor title, what if he's just winning it to pass it to Danielson? You know, and then he beats Brian, Brian, Dan, Brian Danielson beats Jericho. I know they just had a couple of matches. Maybe they do one more as a blow off. This time it's for the Ring of Honor title and Danielson wins it. And now Danielson is the Ring of Honor champion. Maybe fans won't have such a stick up their ass about that. So if Jericho winning the title leads to Danielson winning it again, I think that would be pretty cool. Brian Danielson is the Ring of Honor champion in 2022 or 2023. Pretty awesome. Big, big week scheduled for this week. We've got John Moxley taking on Juice Robinson. Juice Robinson. I think he did recently leave New Japan, so I don't know if he's going to be signing with AEW now. Of course, his woman is there, Tony Storm. And uh, Moxley and Juice are going to be wrestling in a championship eliminator match, meaning I believe if Juice gets the win, he gets a title shot. Uh, but I think he probably won't. And help me if correct me if I'm wrong. Didn't Moxley, didn't Moxley and Juice work for the U.S. title in New Japan, right? I think Moxley either beat Juice for it or vice versa. What happened there? So that'll be a fun rematch and an interesting match to watch on Dynamite. We also hear from Soraya and MJF, and Chris Jericho is having his Ocho celebration. So we're now, now we're going to have to hear Ocho over and over and over again from The Wizard. So that's what's on tap for this week. Uh, I should be here to watch Dynamite this week. There's a slight chance I might miss it. I'm not sure, but I believe I will be here for the watch along on Wednesday, and we'll watch all that stuff together. Should be good. Uh, let me see. Why don't we get into SmackDown? I'm sorry, not SmackDown. Let's stick with Rampage or stick with AEW and get into Rampage, and then we'll finish it up with some SmackDown stuff. But let me go. Gilbert, am I on the set of Top Gun? No, I don't think I am. I might be. Who knows? AEW has four pages, right? Yeah, Diamond Atlas page, Ethan page, Adam page. Who else? Who's the other page? Black was also super complimentary of WWE when he got released. He never wanted to leave. That's right. He never really did. Uh, And, you know, for him to go right over and sign so quickly a five-year deal like that, you know, he might have had some remorse, you know. It's definitely possible. Monique, appreciate the seven bucks from you. Good to see you and welcome back. Punk also said on August 20th, his one-year anniversary, that this is his best year of his career, and he flipped the switch two weeks later. He needs to grow up. Exactly. He was talking about what a great year it was for him, and he was right. It was a great year. It was great to see him back, despite all the stuff that apparently was going on behind the scenes to us in front of our fans' eyes. What we were seeing was great. It was good to see CM Punk back, wrestling at a high level. All of his feuds were good. His feud with MJF was probably one of the best AEW has done so far in their entire history. And then, boom, right after that, all of a sudden he's mad. He went into that scrum with a stick up his ass, and he wanted to get that stuff off his chest. I believe the reports that he planned a lot of this. It really does feel like he did. And these were things that he was expected and was and wanted to say. Once he went out and won the title, I'm going to go tear apart the executives. And and he did it, man. Uh, WWF fan 22, five more bucks from you. Thank you. Punk also did two UFC fights where he took bad damage. Even though it's only two fights, it can really change a person. Yeah, he got his ass whipped twice in the UFC ring. So that's true as well. WWE needs to get rid of money in the bank, Stephen Harris. I don't know, man. Money in the bank is... I was never, like, a giant fan of it, and I really hate pay-per-views named after matches, but I also think money in the bank is a really good substitute for the king of the ring, and I think that there should always be a big five. There should be Rumble, Mania, SummerSlam, Survivor Series, and then one in the middle It used to be king of the ring. And now, you know, having it be money in the bank, I am okay with. What I would rather do is get rid of Elimination Chamber. What I would rather do is get rid of TLC. Get one of those, or Hell in the Cell, better yet. Get rid of Hell in the Cell, get rid of Elimination Chamber, and get rid of TLC, and just use those matches whenever you want. If you have a situation that can only be resolved in a chamber, then boom, you book your fucking chamber match. If you have a situation that can only be solved in a cell, 
boom, you book your fucking cell match. Same thing with TLC. I really hate when you have pay-per-views on the schedule where you know you have to have two Hell in the Cell matches. What if you don't have any feuds going on at the time that are really, really deeply personal or would even warrant a Hell in the Cell? And that's why I think these pay-per-views on the schedule fuck up your creative because it forces you to adapt to that when you should just be able to tell your stories and then plug the matches in where you need them on whatever pay-per-view happens to be standing in front of you. It would be so much easier from a creative standpoint if that's the way you did it. So um, I'm with you, sort of. I wouldn't get rid of Money in the Bank. I think people like Money in the Bank. Even I like Money in the Bank. Uh, but get rid of a couple of the other ones instead. And I'm with you, Stephen. Stone Cold 10X, appreciate the five bucks. Haven't, haven't you been able to watch every week what is a story with the White Rabbit? Thanks for the info, Greg. Oh, you haven't been able to watch. Well, Stone Cold, just rewind a little bit. One of the first topics we talked about about 20 minutes in, right after we finished the shout outs and pleasantries, was we opened with Bray Wyatt, the White Rabbit, what it could all mean, and what form Bray Wyatt could take. Is he by himself? Is he by a fa with a faction? Is he the Fiend? Is he Funhouse Bray? Is he Wyatt Family Bray? Is he Bunny Rabbit Bray? We don't know. So I did talk extensively about that. So just scroll back and you can listen to all of that. And uh, bring back Judgment Day, No Mercy, Armageddon, stuff like that. I'm with you, man. Get rid of those TLCs. Put Armageddon where TLC was. Put Judgment Day where Hell in the Cell is. And put No Mercy where something else is, where Elimination Chamber is. I'm totally down with that. But anyway, let's talk briefly about last night's loaded rampage. Like I said, 47 matches were on this two-hour rampage last night, and it opened up with a really fun tag team match, Sting and Darby Allin taking on House of Black in a no-disqualification tag match. Now, this was great because near the end of the match, Sting is down, and the music, and he's kind of cornered. Darby is uh, Darby's disposed of somewhere else, and some music plays, the lights go down, and it turns out to be the Great Muda. The Great Muda shows up, who's currently in the middle of his retirement run. I believe he has his last match uh, early next year, and he's been, you know, kind of doing his retirement tour, uh, you know, Pro Wrestling Noah right now. And he comes down to the ring. Him and Sting have a ton of history back in the day. This was so fun. Now, unfortunately, I got spoiled on this. I read the Rampage spoilers earlier on in the week. So I actually think I knew about Muda coming out right after it happened because a few people were tweeting it. So I did see it, and I was interested to see that. And uh, I was... Uh, Excited to see, like, kind of how that looks. So Muda comes out, looks to be in great shape despite his age, and uh, he nails uh, Buddy Matthews with a really, or Buddy, uh, yeah, Buddy Matthews with a really nice uh, leg whip. And then when he gets up, he spits the mist right into Buddy Matthews' face, who then falls backwards into the ropes where Julia Hart is standing. Julia Hart is standing on the apron. He bumps into her. She goes flying backwards, back first, and there's a table on the outside of the ring, but she completely overshoots the table. Her ass hits the edge of the table, and it takes like a chunk out of it, but the rest of her back, head, and neck hit the concrete. Flat, unprotected, back, head, and neck bump on the concrete without even breaking her fall. She didn't put her arms out, nothing. She took it so hard I just hope she's okay. I mean, this happened a couple of days ago. If she was, you know, dead or in the hospital or in a coma, we would know it. Apparently she's okay, but I don't know how you can take that bump and not have a concussion. You guys see it? Did you guys see it? It was crazy. One of the worst and ugliest bumps or botches, if you will, that I've seen in AEW. And this came on the same night as one of their other really uncomfortable botches, as we saw on Wednesday night when Athena landed on the face of Britt Baker and smashed her shit all up. So this happened just a couple of hours later that aired last night, and Julia takes that really, really ugly-looking bump. Man, I really hope she's okay. It almost put a damper on a really cool moment uh, with Sting and the Great Muda. Now, once Julia took that bump, Sting was able to hit the Scorpion Death Drop on Matthews for the win. And Muda and Sting had a nice little moment in the ring. Apparently, Stu Sting is going to be a part of Muda's last match on January 22nd. So he's going to go uh, over there and make an appearance. I don't know if he's going to be in the match, maybe a tag team, or just a part of the ceremony. That's really cool. Uh, I have a lot of memories of Sting versus Muda. Just off the top of my head, their WCW and NWA wars, like late 80s and early 90s, is what I remember the most. They had a little bit of uh, affiliation, maybe, or I know Muda was in the NWO when he was on Nitro during that time, but I don't recall what he was doing with Sting. But I remember Sting versus Muda from uh, Starcade 89. I know they wrestled. It might have been 90. I think it was uh, 89 because I think Flair and Sting was 90. 
Um, they did a New Japan WCW shoot Super Show in 91 where they wrestled each other. They did a second show the following year, might have been 93, where they were a tag team taking on the Steiners. Um, I know they wrestled for the IWGP title at least once in 92. They had a ton of TV matches in WCW together, and they had a really fun, interesting run. And I think it's awesome that they brought Muda out right before he's retired to see these two guys, you know, 30, probably 30. Four years since they've wrestled for the first time and seeing them come together on TV again when you never thought you'd see Sting and Muda in the same place ever again. Here we are in late 2022 and we got Sting and Muda in the ring. 45-year-old Greg loves that shit. Let me tell you, loves that shit. Moment of the week for me, easily. Uh, we also saw Action Bronson and Hook defeating 2.0. Props to Action Action Bronson, who's not even a wrestler, but is big enough to be one. Not only does he wrap Hook down to the ring, but he wrestles Hook and Action got the win there. Another tag team match, Wardlow and Samoa Joe, made pretty easy work of Josh Woods and Tony Nese. Jungle Boy defeated Ray Phoenix in a really good singles match, and I loved that one from the minute it was announced because... I think they're giving Jungle Boy some wins on TV until Christian gets healthy enough for them to finally pay off that whole angle. I love the match between Sammy Guevara and Eddie Kingston as well. Of course, these two have resolved their personal issues that uh, came to a head several weeks ago that resulted in an Eddie Kingston suspension. They're back now working together one-on-one. -on -one. Really fun match here. Eddie brutalizes Sammy Guevara, hits him with three of those spinning back fists, and then locks him in a dragon sleeper for the submission victory. Uh, but after after the bell, Eddie refuses to release the hold, keeps it on, and referee Paul Turner, who was challenged by Tony Khan just this week to tighten up security and tighten up uh, the officiating, he decided to take that to heart, and he reversed the decision awarding the match to Sammy Guevara, which was great for Sammy to kind of struggle to get out of the ring and just hobble away while his music played, like he's the winner with uh, Ty Mello carrying him up. I loved all of that, and after the match, uh, Eddie Kingston beat the shit out of security, and Excalibur mentioned that there could be a fine or a suspension involved in that, because there was a fine and suspension involved in the last one, so uh, that was all pretty funny, and We'll see if that's the end of the Guevara and Eddie, Eddie issue or if maybe they do one more blow-off, no DQ match type of thing or non-sanctioned match where they can really beat the hell out of each other. We will see. But Eddie did beat Sammy Guevara pretty straight up there, and maybe that should just be uh, the end of their issue. Uh, Jade Cargill continues her run and retained her TBS title, defeating Diamante. And we had a really fun golden ticket battle royal that saw Hangman Page come out of this as the winner. Now, this will earn Hangman a championship match on Dynamite on October 18th, which is about three weeks away. And that's going to be in Cincinnati. Cincinnati, of course, is the hometown of current AEW world champion John Moxley. So that would be actually a really fun match. I hope whatever they do with Hangman Page doesn't result in him winning the championship yet because i want to see hangman and moxley and i don't even know pardon me as we look it up i can probably look it up and get the answer quicker than you guys telling me i just want to know the date on full gear AEW full gear 2022 is november 5th i think am i right on that oh it's november 19th holy shit so we got a long way to go we got a long full month after this uh championship match on dynamite takes place is when full gear is going down in New Jersey. And I think it's Deshaun you told me you're going to that, right? Or no, it was uh, Divine. Divine's going to that. But that'll be prior to them. So I feel confident that Moxley will be the champion on the 18th. And when we do get to full gear, that's the big question. Is MJF going to cash in at full gear and just make the championship match happen there? Or is he going to try to cash in in a shady way? Based on the type of character MJF is, I believe he has to try to figure out a way to cash this thing in in a sleazy way. Tony Khan has said that he still has to sanction whatever match MJF wants, but still says MJF can get it basically whenever he wants. So it would be really cool if MJF tried to maybe take advantage of somebody who's injured or whatever, or maybe gets Tony Khan to sanction the match and then he goes and attacks uh, the champion to get a, one, a leg up on him or something like that. I don't know, but I hope whatever they do here... If it results in MJF becoming world champion, I hope that he wins it in a sleazy way and gets some heel heat. 
I hope he like takes advantage of a, a buddy bloodied and battered Moxley who by this point has earned so much of the fans respect and then MJF comes out and takes the title from him or steals it in some shady way would be so fun and you know I don't even know. We don't really know the true contract status of MJF. He mentioned in his interview last week with Ariel Hawani that he got paid big time by Tony Khan, upwards of a million dollars plus. But he did not sign a contract extension. He claimed he got paid without adding any extra time to his contract because he wants to test the free agent market in 2024. And he's been dropping WWE hints on TV constantly. So what I'm hoping for AEW's sake is that there has been some secret deal made, some secret extension made with MJF. Tony Khan is paying him, whatever you want, I'll pay you. I want $3 million a year, fine, you got it. That's in effect right now, and they're just not saying anything about it because if Tony Khan is going to allow MJF to have this year, you're going to put your championship on him, hopefully using that championship as a bargaining chip. See, I have faith in you. I want to make you the face of the company, maybe making MJF the champion. Tony thinks that will help convince him to sign with AEW when his contract is up. But I would not want to take that chance. I would not want to give MJF the best year of his life and the most successful year of his life in the company, winning the title and holding it for however many months, only for him to jump to WWE in a year's time, in 15 months' time. So... It's going to be interesting if you're MJF. Obviously, if you're any talent, you would be a fool to not test the free agent waters, you know, to at least see what you can get. Uh, otherwise, you know, Tony Khan's going to have to pay you something that he's absolutely sure that WWE won't match, you know, because Tony Khan's got more money. That's the one good thing about this whole thing here. If it becomes a straight-up bidding war, Tony Khan seems a little weird sometimes. Tony Khan seems like a guy that can get very angry. I wouldn't put it past wild crazy haired tony khan just to pay a motherfucker to keep him away from them because wwe has done that that's a strategy wwe has employed many times you can't criticize tony khan if he does that because it's exactly what wwe does they will pay somebody just to keep them away from the competition they've done it countless times in the past so if tony knows what you know the you know the the mid card or upper to mid card salaries definitely are well there's no way wwe is going to pay you more than 1.2 million I'll pay you 2.5. Just get it out of the way right now. Even if you waited until your contract was up and you negotiate with them, they ain't going to give you this. Maybe that's what he's got to do. You know, so maybe he said, MJF, write down a number. One time in my life, it's actually one of my favorite moments in my life, uh, I was uh, told by a superior uh, who really, really wanted me to take a certain job, and I kept, you know, uh, resisting, and he just said, write down a number. Write down what you want to make. And it was just like the movies. And I did. I wrote down what I wanted to make, folded it up, and handed it back to him. And then he laughed and goes, yeah, right. And I'm like, well, you asked. I was like, that's what I need to be paid for me to do this job for you. And, of course, he declined <laughs> what, I, uh, what I requested. But that was the amount of money it was going to take for me to do it. And it's fun. So maybe they did the same thing with MJF. Maybe Tony Khan said, write down what you want to make. And MJF's like, all right, fine. I'll write down $6 million. And Tony Khan's like, how about two? Deal, two. You know, ask for this, you get this. And instead of asking for this and get this. So MJF, the whole situation with his contract, if it does wind up coming up in 2024, is Tony Khan really going to put the belt on him this year and let him run just for him to dance right over to WWE? So that whole situation is really interesting. And like I said, MJF has said publicly that he's going to go where the money is, whoever pays him more. That's why, if he really believes that, that's why I think Tony Khan might just say, let's not even wait until 2024. They're not going to offer you more than this. This is the max they are going to offer you. Like, I'll pay you what they're paying Roman. How about that? Because they're not going to offer you that. I don't think he's going to pay him what he's paying Roman, but he's going to pay him something very, very nice to where even maybe MJF has to realize, yeah, Triple H ain't even going to match that. So if Tony Khan or if MJF really wants to go with the money is, and he'll, he doesn't care about his legacy or his career, or if he wrestles at WrestleMania, it's all about the money for him, then Tony Khan should pay him. You know, some people it's different. Some people it's more about their career, their legacy. I want to wrestle at WrestleMania. I want to be WWE champion. I grew up on this. It's where I want to be. Other people might have a different way of looking at it. My, other people might just say, I'm only in this to make money, and that's it. <laughs> and I know my value, and I'm here to get paid, and whatever. So 
If he does, you know, sign another extension with AEW, another three years, MJF is still extremely young. MJF could still sign a three- or five-year extension with AEW and still have plenty of time to go to WWE in the future and be a big star there. So uh, MJF is in a really good position. He's got a shit ton of leverage. He is, uh, you know, he's a proven, uh, you know, commodity now who came in, you know, making very little money. And did not have a lot of, uh, you know, track record, you know, beyond MLW and, you know, some of the, the, the waves he was making with his promos and stuff. He didn't have much to offer beyond that. And in his three years in AEW, he has built himself up to a major pillar in that company and uh, should be paid as such. So I'm glad he got his money, but also really curious what kind of year he's going to have. I do feel like you're not going to give that poker chip to MJF and not have him win the title. I think him winning the AEW title is inevitable. Um, but at the same time, you have to think about what he's going to do in 2022. So anyway, that was all uh, just stemming from uh, Hangman Page winning that golden ticket battle royal. He'll have a title shot coming up in a month. And in the main event, last night, great lights out match between Ricky Starks and Powerhouse Hobbs. Powerhouse Hobbs, beat Ricky pretty handily at All Out that surprised many people. But as I said in my All Out review before CM Punk lost his mind, that I feel like this is just one step along their story. There's going to be another match. There's likely going to be a blow off with a stipulation. And that's exactly what we had here. Lights out match. And the finish was amazing. Props to Starks for getting that man, that fucking moose up on his shoulders for the Rochambeau awesome match great work by both guys big hot powerhouse Hobbs fan I do not think this loss will damage him at all and it was a big win for Ricky Starks and I think Ricky Starks is another guy that you need to start looking at in terms of futures future of your company you got MJF you got Ricky Starks you got Darby Allen you know maybe even Jungle Boy to a degree but I think uh, I think Starks and MJF uh, and Darby really stand out as uh, especially Starks and Darby. So Darby, I think is just going to wind up dying, jumping off a bridge or something, or his career is going to end too early because he's like, Oh, cool. Look a bridge. You know, I'm just going to go Peter Pan off that where I think Starks and MJF are, you know, more wrestling 24 seven. They really seem to be uh, focused. I think they have good presentations. They're great on the mic. Ricky and MJF have charisma that doesn't come along every now and then. And if I'm Tony, if I'm Tony Khan, I am locking them down. That's your chance to make your own stars. You know, WWE is making their Romans and their Cenas and stuff. You need guys like that too. And if you have guys like there, like that, who are you know pretty much early in their careers, late twenties, early thirties. A lot of road left to go, already making waves, already creating buzz, already attracting attention. You know, these are the guys that you should really try to go with. And I'm I'm hoping that this is just the beginning for Ricky Starks and he doesn't uh, suffer any more setbacks. Uh, I guess we should also talk about last night's SmackDown briefly. My favorite thing, maybe other than Great Mood showing up to save Sting, was last night's Bloodline promo with Sami Zayn where the bloodline is in the ring. Solo Sokoa, who I love, by the way, I think he's a great addition, uh, acknowledges Roman Reigns. And then Roman Reigns turns his attention to Sami Zayn. And Jay, who we all know hates Sami Zayn, is instructed by Roman to go over to Sami and tear off the bloodline shirt that he's wearing. And he just rips it off. And Sami's sitting there like, oh, shit. And Roman says, you're never going to wear that shirt again. You want to know why? Because I got you a new one. And he throws a shirt over to Sammy, and it's a Sammy. It says SC uh, Honorary Oos is what it says. And the look on Sammy Zane's face, the pure, unadulterated joy that swept over him, touched my heart more than when Randy Savage and, Re and Elizabeth reunited at WrestleMania 7. I haven't cried like that since Bret Hart reunited with Owen and the Bulldog on Raw. It was a beautiful moment. Excuse me. It's beautiful. So beautiful. Ugh. Excuse me. Just needed, just needed a moment there. The joy on Sammy's face to be accepted in hugging Roman Reigns in the middle of the ring. Jimmy is ecstatic. Solo is liking it. And Jay is sitting over there 
on the ropes just fuming. He fucking hates Sami Zayn and Jay's just facial expressions whenever things are going well for Sami is one of the most fun parts about this whole situation. This addition of Sami Zayn and Solo Sokoa has allowed the bloodline to not get stale. We got all those titles right now, uh, you know, centralized in the bloodline. Some fans don't like it. I do. I think it's cool to see all those title belts there, but they do take up a lot of those championships. I understand. And at least they don't have the IC. I still have no idea why they stripped Solo Sokoa of the North American title instead of just having him drop it. But maybe they don't want him to lose. They want to present him as a badass. And I really like the way he's that, you know, he's that one part of the bloodline. He's the guy I'd want on my team fighting for me. That's for damn sure. And the backstage segment they did later was <laughs> might have been my favorite segment of the week where Ricochet and Moss and Madcap Moss are talking to Sammy and they're giving him shit and you know they're saying that he's not a real bloodline member or whatever and then you just hear this ah and in comes Solo smashes into both of them smashes them both into the metal door he rams Ricochet's head against the door a bunch of times beats the fuck out of Moss and then Sammy is like I was just about to do that I was just about to do that so to see solo just coming there like a madman raging and smash those guys up against the door was awesome and to hear sammy go i was just about to do that just cracked me up so right now i tend to like what i i tend to change what i like the most on wwe tv from week to week but right now it's bloodline and it's all bloodline i am of course a ginormous uh sammy Zayn fan as it is and for him to be involved in the bloodline has been pure entertainment, absolute entertainment. Like we talked about earlier, we know that in the end, eventually, Sammy's going to get murdered and it's going to be sad, especially if it happens around the holidays or something. If they can stretch this out till Christmas and beat the shit out of him on Christmas Day, I, I think that would be great. And then maybe Kevin Owens comes to his aid and then Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn beat the Usos for the tag team titles. I think that would be great, but that's a long way off right now. I want to see Sammy have his good weeks and his bad weeks. Next week, he's probably due for a bad week. He'll probably fuck up. Next Friday, he'll cost somebody a match or whatever, and he'll be on the, you know, on the shit list with the bloodline, but then he'll do something to redeem himself or whatever. So we'll see how he keeps going uh, along with uh, the bloodline. But it's my favorite story in WWE. It's so good, and it's so fun. Uh, props to my sister, Liv Morgan, who had a pretty impressive match last night against Lacey Evans. So I guess WWE has abandoned all of that shit they were doing with Lacey Evans, those stupid vignettes and that horrible mind numbing theme music that she comes out to, which I hate. I don't even dislike Lacey Evans. I think she's got a great look. She's big. She's strong. She's somebody that I thought WWE might want to turn into like a female John Cena. You know what I mean? To kind of like go up against and beat like a Ronda Rousey or whatnot. I thought that was what they were going to do with her, but she's kind of been got a hard reset here and they're just putting her out there to lose matches for the most part. She was in there with the SmackDown champion last night and Lacey, or I'm sorry, uh, Liv Morgan is able to beat Lacey clean, hit her with her little, uh, I don't know, a little finisher thing that she does. And then after the match, because there was so much talk during the match about her match with Ronda Rousey at Extreme Rules and can Liv get extreme? Well, she decided to get extreme. After she beat Lacey Evans, she grabbed the kendo stick, wore out Lacey with that, then pulled out a table on the outside of the ring, laid Lacey on the table, goes in the ring, climbs to the top rope. And actually, I don't even think she was on the top rope. She was standing on the, uh, the ring post, that big... LED ring post that is now big enough for you to stand on. Couldn't imagine when I was a kid you being able to stand on the ring post, but apparently you can now. She's standing on that great camera shot of the camera's basically like below Lacey looking up at Liv. And I'm like, holy shit, she's going to do a big table bump here. I didn't know what she was going to do. I thought she was going to frog splash her, but she hit her with a send on from the top rope and Liv just dives off, nails Lacey, lands it perfectly. Great shot of uh, Liv at the end going, yeah, you know, screaming. And she's basically trying to show and prove that she can get extreme and Ronda is in for a fight at Extreme Rules. So I thought that was all really well done by Liv Morgan. She definitely handled her table bump a lot better than Julia Hart handled hers. And like I said, again, all the best to Julia Hart. I am terrified for her. That was one of the worst bumps I've ever seen. And she's so young and so small. I just hope she's okay. Liv Morgan landed much more safely and uh, basically is ready to get extreme with Ronda Rousey. Part of me thinks she might actually win and beat Ronda Rousey. I, I like Liv Morgan 
but she's also not one of my favorites at the same time. I think she tries really hard. There's just something she she's just not she's not Charlotte, you know, to be honest, in the ring. She's not Charlotte. She's not Alexa. She's not Becky. She or I'm sorry, she's not not Alexa. She's not Asuka. Uh, she's not Becky. She's certainly not Bianca Belair. She has her moments. She's good at some things. Some of her match sequences. I just think her ring work isn't necessarily bad, but you know, I don't consider one of her one of the best in-ring women's workers that we have. I think she's somebody who's there, who's got a great attitude, who's willing to do business and is positive. And maybe her title run is more of a reward for your hard work rather than this is who the fans actually want to see. I, I could be wrong there. I know a lot of fans love Liv Morgan. I just, there to me, there's something missing that's going to prevent her in my mind. God, I hate saying that because it sounds such like a, such an asshole thing to say. Something that's just going to prevent her in my mind from getting to that Charlotte level. A lot of that could be the booking, but, you know, a lot of it is what, you know, her ability actually is. So I think at Extreme Rules, this is a big match for her. She could prove me wrong. She could prove a lot of people wrong. Go out there and have a barn burner with Ronda Rousey. And Ronda Rousey, for as much as I don't really like her and how fucking damn boring she is, she's another person that really seems perfectly willing to do business and uh, I think will give Liv Morgan a good match and hopefully the two can survive, uh, can surprise us. And if you are going to have Liv Morgan retain here, how are you going to do that? This is an extreme rules match, right? How is she going to how is she going to figure out a way to beat Ronda Rousey? She's going to have to cheat or something or maybe tie Ronda Rousey down if they want to actually make it seem like Liv can beat her straight up. I don't know. You know, she already beat Shayna Baszler, so we will see what happens at Extreme Rules, but I worry that her title could be in jeopardy with Ronda Rousey, but I was also worried about that at SummerSlam. So uh, we will see there. Uh, New Day took on Maximum Male Models. They defeated the Maximums after the match. Max Dupree struggles to get his jacket off, but finally tears it off, slams it down, throws it at his model uh, cohorts, and then storms away from the ring very, very mad. A couple of weeks ago on SmackDown, made some sort of reference uh, in order to leave the day. you got to find the night, something like that. So all of these little hints are kind of teasing that Max Dupree could be returning to the L.A. Knight gimmick, which I believe he never should have lost. Only in WWE will you bring somebody in, give them a WWE name, and then change that and give them another WWE name. It's it's ridiculous. So uh, I like the Maximum Male Models. I love Mansoor and Masse or however you say their names. I think the whole faction is hilarious, and I love it. But I think that L.A. Knight is too valuable from a charisma standpoint or on the mic to be doing some of this dumb shit. And uh, I hope uh, LA Knight uh, makes his return to wrestling sometime soon. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Strowman also defeated Otis. Pretty good match between these two. I was surprised. I actually didn't hate it. Strowman beat him with a power bomb, power bombing Otis. It's got to be hard. Strowman got the win there. Also, Raquel. Rodriguez defeated Dakota Kai. She had some help from Shotzi, who was out there at ringside to try to fend off uh, the rest of damage control. And uh, Raquel and Shotzi have formed or reformed a little bit of a bond there. And there has been a report by Fightful that they have brought the tank to SmackDown the past two weeks and have not used it. Now, last week on Raw, we saw damage control come out in that like golf cart thing. So I thought that was a sure sign that they're going to start driving that around and maybe Shotzi will bring out the tank and fucking shoot them and blow up their golf cart or something like that I thought would be fun. Uh, but uh, two weeks in a row, they've had that tank backstage and have not made use of it. So uh, we will see if that winds up happening. And like I mentioned earlier, the main event of SmackDown last night was a really good match between the Usos and the Brawling Brutes. For the tag team titles, uh, Aperium made their uh, presence known at ringside Gunther attacking Sheamus pretty sure the two of them are going to have another intercontinental title match at extreme rules which Sheamus might actually win I hope not because like I said if Survivor Series is going to do war games I still hope we do some champion versus champion matches it's going to be hard for the Usos and Roman to do anything but we could get Bobby Lashley and Gunther and that would be sweet but it's also very possible that Sheamus winds up winning the IC title as well uh, at Extreme Rules. The only official matches we have for Extreme Rules right now, Matt Riddle versus Seth Rollins, Drew McIntyre versus Karrion Cross, and Liv Morgan versus Ronda. Incidentally, I should mention the McIntyre promo 
promo last night. He had a strap in his hand, and he was saying that uh, there's going to be a strap match between him and Cross at Extreme Rules, and that's when Karrion Cross attacks, and Scarlet attempts to shoot Drew McIntyre with uh, flash paper or a fireball and misses completely, uh, but they were able to still finish the segment, and Karrion was able to uh, choke out Drew. So uh, that was all in all a pretty decent SmackDown last night, and Extreme Rules is looking pretty good so there you go there is your wrestling results in a nutshell and that is pretty much it for my notes and i've got to get out of here and head to work but before i do that let's just knock out a couple of more super chats and then we will sign off and we'll we will be up here for tomorrow night's watch along uh victor cologne appreciate you being here man welcome back appreciate the five bucks money in the bank is a good kickoff for SummerSlam, just like royal rumble is a kickoff for mania that's true plus money in the bank can make a star also very true Stone Cold 10X, they should use WCW pay-per-view names for the main roster, Halloween Havoc instead of Hell in the Cell. I agree. I'd like to see Fall Brawl and uh, Halloween Havocs and all that stuff, and they have used a few of them in NXT in the past as well, so I'm all about that. Well, I think I have got to get out of here now. i got to head to work. I appreciate you guys being here this afternoon. Don't forget to join us tomorrow night for the Watch Along. The link will be up later tonight, as will the audio to this podcast. And in the meantime, if you guys can just hit the thumbs up button out the door and subscribe, I would appreciate it. You guys have a great rest of your Saturday. Thank you, as always, for being here. And I can't wait to hang out with you guys tomorrow night and watch some wrestling. Y'all take care.